As we wind out the rest of Black History Month in February, I want to do a shout out to Natasha Nichols. Natasha, some of you may remember, was with us early last spring as we were getting into the gardening season, and it seemed like a great time to bring that episode back up. I really encourage you to check out We Sow, We Grow online. They are doing amazing things, and if you're thinking about gardening this year and want to be part of a community that really is empowering people to grow food in their backyard, this is one that has a great vibe. Food is more than just what's on our plate. It's the places where it's grown, it's the people who grow it, and so much more. Join me, Janice Person, your host, on Grounded by the Farm every other week as we talk about the foods we love. Hey everybody, I think you're going to love this episode because right now as I listen to people and see what's happening in society, a lot of people have a different interest in gardening. So many of us expect to be home a lot more over the summer than usual and a lot of us are thinking about how nice fresh tomatoes or fresh peppers would be. That led me to talk to Natasha Nichols. Natasha and I have been friends for probably close to a decade now, really dear friends, and last year in May I I was finally able to see her urban farm, her garden, in the south side of Chicago. Before we get started with this, I want to go ahead and plug on the front end the We Sow, We Grow gardening chat. I'll make sure I have links for that and some of the other things in the show notes. But I think you're going to want to listen through the entire show. Her passion for gardening is so rich and so deep. Natasha, like me, had a Southern grandmom who loved to garden. That was Granny Blackburn. So let's go ahead and get started as I ask Natasha. So why don't we start with where you started gardening? Was it when you guys bought the house you're in now? that you started gardening in your backyard? Or where do you trace your gardening back to? Is it Granny Blackburn? Oh, you mentioned Granny Blackburn. Granny Blackburn (laughs) is my mom's mom. Um, And she's the person who uh, really instilled a love of all things, I think, um, earth bound to me, you know, uh, just sitting and relaxing and taking in nature. Actually, uh, I started gardening for our family in 2013 and in the condo that I lived in, we didn't have um, a backyard at all. So we had to do the uh, patio gardening. So we had to get our, you know, containers and then all the soil and put the stuff in. And I had absolutely no idea what I was doing. So I (laughs) didn't know about spacing. Um, We planted broccoli and I let it go to seed because I thought that, you know, um, there would be multiple heads of broccoli that would grow. And someone happened to tell me, cause I was taking pictures of it every day and they're like, uh, your broccoli's going to seed. You should have picked it by now. So that was my <laughs> very first, you know, lesson in spacing companion planting and just knowing what the heck worked uh, with everything. When we did decide to build our own home, I was very adamant about having space to grow food. And it was just supposed to be for cucumbers and tomatoes. And it grew to much more than that. So we ended up growing corn. (laughs) We ended up growing corn and strawberries and watermelons. Um, And then that, from there, we went to starting an urban farm in the neighborhood. So I've gone from hobbyist to kind of full-fledged farmer in, what, seven years? Yeah, it was fast. I remember... I remember watching it like on Facebook and early on, I can remember the sense of wonder. So your youngest, your twins, how old are they? They will be 10 and later this year. Yeah. I remember a sense of wonder in their eyes and excitement when you first started your garden. It was amazingly compelling to watch them. (laughs) It still is, but they were so tiny. Yeah, now that little one, my my youngest daughter can absolutely run the farm herself if if I let her. uh, Yeah, and she's older than us. Yeah. Yeah, she's she's seventy five. She is uh, that's Mother Nichols. That's what we call her around here. Um, <laughs> but she's the uh, the one child that's gleaned the most off of what I've learned as well. Everybody participates, but she is um, she's taken a special interest in being able to identify plants 
uh, and know exactly what we're planting and why we're planting it and what the actual name is, not just the tomato. She needs to know the variety of tomatoes. So when people come and ask about it, she's able to give them that information. She loves being a resource on that stuff. She, she, studies, she knows whether it's a big boy or something else. Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> it's awesome to watch them. And the other kids also work with the garden some. Yes. Um, so my oldest daughter is our livestock wrangler. She is fully focused on the chickens way more than everybody else. However, my youngest son is the person who was able to hold all of the chickens first, even though I <laughs> fed them every single day. Uh, they would submit and, you know, obviously people who've kept chickens know that they go into a crouching position when, you know, they're allowing you to pick them up and they all did it for them. And we all kind of talked smack behind his back because it happened so easily. My oldest um, is just kind of there. <laughs> well, he, he helps. He's usually uh, at college. Yeah, he's part usually of college. And he helps. And he always makes sure that we have enough basil and tomatoes so he can do he can do capri, capri salads. Yeah. All the time. All the time. All the time. So you went from having a few containers and then you started doing square foot gardening in the backyard. Yes. Is that right? Yes. Yes. And that was, um, that really, I think that really catapulted um, me wanting to have everybody do this, you know, kind of one of those things where you discover this brand new thing and you're just like, everybody needs to try this. And it went from wanting to start a community garden to wanting just a gardening community where people could come to learn on, on our uh, farm without having to invest dollars that they maybe didn't have or time that they also didn't have. So they were able to come through and get the, they're able to come through and get the produce that they need while also asking questions. And now if you go in my backyard and look into the other backyards of neighbors, they all kind of have things growing and it's pretty neat uh, to see. And, you know, they'll come and ask questions. Well, this isn't doing right, Natasha. Can you help me out with this? And then, you know, those conversations start. So they don't necessarily help on the farm any longer, but we're still a valuable resource to them. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, you know, I finally got to see the garden last spring. You did, it was, yes. It was too cold. Um, <laughs> I've watched it on video and online so long, it felt like I had to get there. And I think it was May, and it was a weird cold day. Um, but I can remember getting in the car and telling them I was going to a garden. And they looked at the address that I had plugged in, and they went, um, excuse me, what's the address you wanted to go to? Because you're on the south side of Chicago. It's not necessarily known as the garden center. No, it's, right? far, it's far south too. So already when you when you talk about farming in Chicago, people look at you weird because we're we're urban, right? You think skyscrapers, sidewalks when, when you think of Chicago. Right. Um, we have- Everybody uh, thinks of that big bean and right. and, uh, the big bean. Right, and we're, the lake. We're, we're so much more than the lakefront in downtown Chicago. Um, we actually have a pretty robust urban farming culture in, in the city. And a lot of people do not know that and aren't aware. I've been to more conferences in the last year with people. And I'm like, wait, where are you farming again? And they're like, oh yeah, we're in Rogers Park. You know, we're in Lincoln Park, you know, um, spaces and they're hidden until you walk by them. And then people are like, oh, wow. You know, so now... I'm known as the farmer. Lots of children in the neighborhood call me the farmer lady. And and then the adults say, you know, the person that keeps the chickens, you know, the, the one that has all those chickens on, you know. Uh, so neither title bothers me much. And I'm, I'm happy to bring some sort of awareness. So now people know they can get eggs. People know that they can come and try new varieties of um, cabbage or watermelons or... Um, tomatoes instead of what's given to them in grocery stores. We are a resource um, where people don't have to walk as far to a grocery store. And and now people in the neighborhood are telling their family members who live in suburbs, hey, there's a farm out here. We want you to come and see it. And <laughs> then we get visitors that way. So, you know, it's it's fun. It's always fun to see. It is something that instills a sense of pride in people to know 
but they they have some of this ability in their own neighborhood. I mean, it always did for me growing up. I mean, I liked to be able to grow plants. My parents gardened, my grandmother gardened. You you point to it and you think I did this. It's nice, right? Like it and is. yours yours is not only in your backyard. We said you have a farm. A lot of people will have trouble understanding how that works. So why don't you give them a picture of sort of what your place looks like? It's okay. Because you have your house and your lot, yes, which is it's your yard. Correct. And then you have additional space. Right. I have, um, there, there are lots of open space properties in the city uh, where the city is taking care of them and they're responsible for taking care of them. So community members will oftentimes... Um, there, there are a lot of people who are doing like guerrilla gardening <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and exactly. they take over, they take over a space um, until the city kicks them off. I am not doing that. We have gone through a very long process with the alderman of our ward to be awarded that land. Um, and in partnership with the city of Chicago and the agricultural area of Chicago, we're working on having that, land um, acquisition done for us so that not only are we taking something off of the city's hands where they don't have to um, take care of it for the rest of whatever, uh, we're beautifying right. we're beautifying our neighborhood. So my farm is not acreage. I can't say that I have 1100 acres of, of farm land at all. I don't I don't you know I don't have to get up at four o'clock in the morning um, and stay out all day long uh, working the land but, we do work hard on the quarter acre that we do have and we grow a lot of food in that, in that small, you know, space. Right. And I'm really proud of it because, you know, and, and I think with, with any farmer uh, to know that you've grown something from such a small seed source into mm-hmm. something that families and community members can, can eat um, and you're providing food for people um, and in education, it's, it's kind of a, it's kind of amazing. Yeah. You went from, I remember when you were square foot gardening and we talked a lot and I was lucky enough to be in a job where I was able to put you in touch with resources and we did a few projects and and were able to provide some seed, but you've really spent time sinking in and getting really good information. Tell me about that Master Gardener program and sort of what it's doing for you. Oh gosh. Uh, The Master, so Master Urban Farmer, um, which also encompasses Master Gardener. So I can wear both titles, okay. which is, yeah. you know, something th- that I, I, I'm, I'm going to hate saying this because somebody's going to hate me for it. It's not something that I put too much credence in because you can have a title and still not know crap, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, you right? can, yeah. yes. Um, however, it was, it was an intense time for me. Um, because I started that class right after my one of my siblings, my brother, was in a, a car accident. And then he ended up passing while I was still in that class. So I had two options, which was to quit because, you know, I don't think anybody would have blamed me. Or, or continue moving forward and kind of focusing all of that energy on becoming the best resource. And there was one thing about my brother um he absolutely supported and it didn't matter if if uh it was like it wasn't out loud from the rooftops at all there were just little things that he would do and you know people would come by and say hey yeah daniel told me to to come by and i'm just like what what are you talking about <laughs> yeah daniel told me to come by and drop this off to you so it was it was little ways like that. And when he was in the hospital, when I told him that I got accepted to the program and, you know, that school started a certain day, he would always kind of look at the clock and say, you need to get to class. So even when, when he was in the hospital, he was always, you know, making sure that I was moving forward with this entire project and, and making sure that, you know, we were, we were staying on course and, um, now I'm in a fellowship, which is also pretty, pretty rough. Um, <laughs> mostly because it's just, I think for those of us who work from home, it's kind of hard to sit still for four hours. Like, honestly, just sit still. And <laughs> that's what I have to do with the fellowship once a week. And, you know, there's homework, which is great. 
um, because that keeps me on on task for things that I need to do for the nonprofit that we have. Yeah. But it is so hard for me to sit down for four hours. And it's a pretty long fellowship. Uh, it's it's about uh, 10 months long. So we just started. Wow. Yeah, we just started in March and, you know, we're, we're not even, we haven't even tipped the scale yet. So, and then we were meeting in person and the wonderful pandemic happened. So now we're on Zoom, um, which is <laughs> one of those things where it's a blessing and a curse because being on Zoom, you can still do things while, while you're, so you'll see all of the people in the fellowship. We're all like <laughs> doing our planting or, you know, checking on chickens <laughs> while, Yeah. Uh, whereas we, we kind of lost that time meeting, meeting yeah. in, in, in person. So it's, I don't know. It's, it's just a weird, it's a weird time <laughs> right now, but, but that's you've where, been, where I am. You've been, you've been learning a lot about fertilizer, about seeds, about planting, about weather patterns, about pests. Yes. I mean, you, you're not bragging about what a master gardener or a master urban farmer is, but I want people to understand it's like a classroom of study that's really very intense and takes a lot of dedication. And it and it is a certain amount of learning, like any other degree or any other certification. So yes. you play it off, I, I but do. I ain't going to let you. <laughs> I do. And my, my, my husband also kind of fusses at me about that as well. Um, I don't know. It's just this is a love of mine, you know, and I, I can totally understand when you hear uh, a farmer say, you know, they just really, really love what they do. Um, and it's not, it's not making money obviously is really great. Right. <laughs> right. It's, it's a really <laughs> great thing. Um, and, and fundraising enough to be able to pay staff members who would be on the nonprofit, um, is awesome and amazing, but I really, really just love doing this. It's, it's one of the reasons I don't charge for the educational portion of, of the nonprofit. Um, I just I like it. It's there's something nerdy and geeky <laughs> about about learning about plants and you know why certain types of soil do certain types of things to you know seeds and why you can't plant certain plants next to each other and why hornworms are stupid. Like you know they're, <laughs> they're <So> nasty. <laughs> there's a joy in that, um, <laughs> and then just being able to see the literal fruits of your labor. It's it's amazing to me. And it makes me feel good, you know, come June and July when we're actually pulling stuff off the off the stems yeah. of things. Yeah, that always feels amazing. Amazing. Um, last year probably didn't feel quite as amazing though, right? Like no. the year was pretty hard. The year sucked. Um, and and I'm going to be also controversial here. Last year sucked more than this year sucks right now for me. Um <laughs> It's it in the was, age of the pandemic. Yeah. Last year was worse. Last year was was very very horrible. Um, for several second, you know, my second sibling passing away. Um, um, yeah, that's number one. And then it rained so much in the Midwest, and and you know the weather just would not cooperate. So that on top of you know dealing yeah. with personal issues, it just made for a very, very um, horrible season. Uh, we still grew things and, and things survived, but it was not, I still don't think that we, we have matched our very first year of farming where, you know, it's like that, that first child that you have where they yeah. make you think that parenthood is going to be easy. And then that second, third and fourth child come through and let you know that you don't know what the heck you're doing. So well, Nathaniel reminds you now, parenting isn't always easy to <laughs> I can only say that because yeah. I love your kids all. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. He is now he is now a very interesting kid to interact with. College students they, are are just wonderful. Yeah. They are. They absolutely are. So um so what was what was that one magical year, that first magical year? Is that the year Harry Connick came over to play? It is. That's the very first year that <laughs> Harry Connick Jr. came came over, came to my house, rang my bell, you know, like it was no big deal. I I But you think guys have installed so many like raised beds that year. You had a lot of momentum coming together. We did. We did. Now last year though 
was fantastic volunteer wise. We had way more yeah. volunteers last year than we have ever had in all the three years prior to that. But the first year we just had a ton of food and we were able to give a lot of it away um, to food banks and then, you know, community members. When, when I think about overall, we've been growing bigger and better, you know, and, and yeah. we're learning and, 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 you know, using that, that knowledge that we have to stay better. So last year mm-hmm. we learned, you know, at the end of the season, cover your beds after you clean them <laughs> because <laughs> there's always a lesson to be learned. Always, always. And now we're able, we'll be able to start with a fresh bed that's weeded already mm-hmm. and not, not have to yeah. worry about doing all of that stuff. Yeah, it's tough when you're trying to do raised beds. You guys had to bring in soil. Part of the thing about city lots is buildings used to be on some of them. Lots of people use them for whatever trash they wanted to at different times and stuff. So you guys have really had to reclaim that space and really make it work so it produces food in such an amazing way. You did that by calling it a specific effort and making it a nonprofit over time. But at first you just called it We So We Grow. Mm-hmm. And now it's finally the organization you wanted to be. Tell people about that because it's awesome. Oh, We So We Grow. It's a, a gardening community initiative. And we are all about teaching people how to properly grow their own food. And we want to be a resource to people all over the, the globe, not just on the south side of Chicago, as to growing food and knowing. And if you join our community, you will see some people who didn't know (laughs) what they were doing at all when they first joined our community. And now they have some of the most spectacular backyard gardens I've ever seen before in my life. Like I'm jealous now. And I would agree. Yeah. It's, it's one of those things where you're just like, what, how did that happen? And, you know, um, I love knowing that I kind of planted that seed. Uh, for them and they kind of, you know, took off. And, you know, I we know that we're not the only gardening community out there, but I think we're, yeah. we're one of the ones where um, every grower is, is welcome. And it, right. we, we don't take, we don't do a lot of like, you know, downplaying other people's efforts or what they're growing or how they're growing or whatever. And, you know, we have people knowledgeable on both sides of the spectrum, whether they're organic growers or conventional growers. Um, And then large scale, we have large scale farmers there who are amazing. Um, And then we have people who are just like, listen, I have four containers. I need to know what I can grow in these four containers so that, you know, I do well and it works well. Everything works well. Yeah, no. And I think some of them um, maybe have gone from four containers to, well, maybe let's go with 10 or 12. Or I mean, there's a couple of them in there. I keep seeing up the number of containers every week or something. It's amazing. Because it it seems like such a stress reliever for folks right now. It, It seems like a lot of people are turning to different stress relievers and being outside and working with soil and plants feels good it really does and it's a it's a good stress reliever and you're not you're not in front of the computer and the screen and you're in the sun and fresh air and you're just working soil and you're you're kind of giving you know life to something (laughs) and it's it's amazing right exactly exactly i remember when you were giving life to watermelons do you (laughs) do you want to talk about watermelon (laughs) <laughs> Apparently, watermelons are a very hot commodity in my community, um, <laughs> and we really have to. And this is, I think, watermelons are the only watermelons and sun sugars, sun sugar tomatoes. Oh yeah, the tomatoes oh, are yeah. the only crops where we actually have to think about where the heck we're planting them, so they cannot be easily seen from the street because people <laughs> will park their cars or they will stop their bikes or stop their walk and walk right onto the farm and help themselves to, you know, uh, uh, our, our fruits and vegetables. And overall, I am not against sharing with people. I am against people just taking without asking. And it doesn't yeah. matter. You know, there are people who do not even live in the neighborhood and they're like, yeah, 
you know, I was talking to my friend and they told me that there, there was this awesome farm out here and it's a U pick farm. I said, Do you see U pick anywhere on the signage? <laughs> like, do you see any signage that says U pick? No, you have to come I, and help. I see it. Or you pay, you know, either way. So, uh, watermelons are, are a hot commodity. And I don't, there's something about growing your own watermelons. It's kind of, I mean, you see them go from so teeny tiny yeah. and a flower to being yeah. like, they're massive. <gasps> they're massive. And you wait for them to be perfect. And then some person comes and Somebody randomly takes it, it off the, <laughs> takes it off the stem. Oh, yeah. So, so you have pest of a much larger time than some, but you know, it's, it's interesting because a lot of times people are driving down the highway and they see corn growing on the side of the road and they think, Ooh, I'm just going to hop out. And the farmer won't care if I get like half a dozen ears of corn and they'll start picking corn and they don't know the difference between sweet corn and grain. And, and so then they, then get they really upset. corn. Yep. Corn tastes really bad on that farm, and it's because they're growing corn for, like, cows and pigs and stuff, or tortillas instead of, like, for us to eat as sweet corn on the cob. But, yeah, so I, I think other farmers feel that a little bit, but I do think that you have a different sense of passion for each individual watermelon <laughs> than friends of mine who grow watermelons on acres and acres of land. Yeah, it's just since we grow such a small, smaller amount of of watermelon and and produce and everything, it's just for us, every single one is worth a whole lot of money. And it is there's something about <laughs> dreaming about tasting that first watermelon of the summer of the season and watching somebody walk off down the street with it because they think that it's, you know, that it's a, a farm. We have not had an issue since the very first um, time. Yeah. And that very first time it was, I may have overreacted a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, but it was, it was at a time where um, people, well, people should know watermelons take about a hundred to 130 days to ripen and we were maybe 20 days off from from and you know been watching it for a hundred and something <laughs> days every day tending it with love and care and from dreaming, having this dreaming of that day when you cut it open and somebody drove up and clipped it and you know i got it back but it, it didn't stay on long enough the good thing is, and I think I think that this is where the good Lord felt bad for me. He made sure that the watermelon tasted very, very good. Um, <laughs> so even though it hadn't it hadn't ripened all the way, uh, I think he took pity on me and was just like, you know what? Let's just go ahead. Let's just go ahead and there. make this one okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, what all do you grow besides watermelon? You guys have tomatoes, peppers. What all else? Um. Carrots, beets, radishes. Uh, right now we have garlic in the ground. We have four beds of garlic. So that is going to be pretty amazing when when we're able to harvest those. Uh, we grow collards, mustards, turnips, because living in the black community, you have to make sure that you have greens. We also do kale, um, three different kinds. So red Russian, the dwarf blue, and then the dinosaur kale, um, lacinto kale. Uh, we've done a variety of squashes so um full-blown pumpkins acorn squash you know spaghetti squash butternut squash um i do want to do the um is it patty pies um patty pan patty pan uh squash yeah. so we want to do that um cucumbers of course okra yeah. um we've had all types of herbs we do corn um, and we had a really great crop of corn our very first year as well, but we planted it. We didn't get the timing just right. So then we had corn earworms come through and yeah. they destroyed quite a bit of it. And because it was our very first year growing, we didn't realize that all we had to do was just break off wherever they had eaten. And then we could have enjoyed, you know, cause <laughs> we're still city folks. So there, there are certain things that didn't catch on that first year. And now we wouldn't look at it weird if it happened. We'd just break it off and then eat the rest of it if we needed to. Um, 
but it, it's been nice to go out and see things like um, monarchs because we yeah. we have a very large um, population of uh, monarch butterflies that come through because we have um, milkweed that grows on the farm as well, you know. And then swallowtails we've had because they land on our dill and our carrots. We have Asian praying mantises, which are actually um, kind of an infestation, but they <laughs> keep the they keep the grasshoppers and things down, so we let them stay. They get massive though, so when they fly overhead while you're working, it almost feels like a bird is flying too close to your head, and then a mantis lands, and you're just like, "Why did God create such weird creatures?" <laughs> um, thank you for helping, but you know. Can you not fly so close to my head? Um, I'm trying to think of what else. How many we, how many times a year do you typically plant? Because I know like you've started seed inside for now, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And you, you're you looking forward to that day you actually get to put them in the ground outside? Or do yeah. you have some in the ground out already? Um, it's like you're reading my mind. Today was going to be the day that we actually put some of the cold, hardy plants out. Yeah. And, and then start... Um, succession planting, which we haven't done before. So this would be the first year that we succession planted and uh, kind of to see how we like that. We also realized that um, we do need a greenhouse and we need something where we can grow all year long so that people can have things um, throughout the entire year. Cause there's no reason that we shouldn't be able to do that. Right. Right. You have to get electric and water. Um, yes, which the city, which we'll work it out with the city where they will provide it for us, um, at a, either a lower cost or for free. Cause you're no, a, you're, you're a nonprofit free. with, um, Correct. whatever that kind of designation of the nonprofit is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what would you, if somebody's listening and thinks this is a the year they want to start gardening, where would you tell them to start? Oh, that's hard. I would have to tell them to start with what they love eating. So, yes. you know, if they like eating um, um, pasta, I would tell them to grow basil and tomatoes and um, maybe not garlic, not this first year, because garlic needs to be overwintered. So a lot of people don't know that, that they can't just plant garlic in the spring and then expect it to grow up. Um, it has to be planted in October in the colder states and and then you harvest in June or July. Uh, but start with what you like eating. We liked, we started with uh, pickles, pickling cucumbers, because we go we go through pickles like, <laughs> like crazy. And we don't slice them up. We leave them whole so everybody can just have a whole pickle to walk around with. Um, and tomatoes. We go through, we went through a lot of tomatoes. I thought we would eat more greens than what we did. We did not. But the senior citizens who live around here took care of that for us. So, you know, they ate all of the, the collards and the, the mustards and the turnips. Um, but, yeah, start with start with what you like eating. That's and, a really good way to look at it. Yeah. Yeah. It's that's and, and then that way it won't be a chore. You know what I mean? You know, you won't look at them. Why am I growing these carrots? I don't even like carrots. So why did you plant them? Like, don't yeah. don't plant stuff that you don't want to eat. Don't be very very stingy with seed because there's no guarantee that if you're planting one seed at a time that is actually going to germinate properly you have to know how to do what you're doing and and be okay with experimentation you know it's fun you can tell how much natasha loves gardening right i mean she wants it to be fun for you it's hard to tell everybody how to garden. There's so many differences from one area of the country to another, even from one area of Chicago to another, you can find some big differences. Part of that reality is why she founded this We Sow We Grow Garden Chat that we mentioned a little bit in the uh, program as we were talking about it. It has grown to have people all around the U.S. It's been there for a few years, but almost every day right now, new members are signing up. I talk about my container garden there some. Some friends actually have gardens that you run year round, but you can learn a lot from others who've had some experiences, who are willing to celebrate your accomplishments and bemoan some of the losses like we all talked about from last year. 
on the podcast. I would appreciate your help getting this in front of other people. I'd appreciate your hitting subscribe and asking your friends to do the same if you think they'd enjoy this content. Also go over and check out groundedbythefarm.com. That's the website where we put not only the podcast, but various blog posts, various information, recipes from farmers around the country, and all pop up on Grounded by the Farm. Thanks so much. And until next time, we'll see you later.